In 2019, millions of Indians watched on as their nation launched its most ambitious lunar mission to date. Over $80 million had been spent and the nation's pride was on display and on the line. Narendra Modi, India's Prime Minister, watched from mission control as the lunar lander made its final heart-stopping descent. Then, communication was lost. The lander had crashed into the lunar surface. The encouragement and solidarity of Prime Minister Modi. Despite the failure, this mission signaled a new direction for India's space agency, the ISRO. Through the 90s, it had created arguably the world's most cost-effective space program. With NASA, it was about pushing the boundaries of innovation, sending hardware to areas in the solar system or in the universe that weren't sent before. Within India, it was about setting up infrastructure that could support the country. Over the last decade, India has ripped up its old rulebook and launched missions to Mars and the Moon. The early ambition of helping its people is now extending to leading the world. Our current Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, he does see space as a strategic sector. Historically, India has not competed with the mega budgets and ambitions of the great spacefaring nations. But that's changed. India now wants to take its next giant leap into space. India's space story stands apart from the space pioneering nations. In July 1980, over two decades after Sputnik, India launched its Rohini satellite, making them the newest member of an exclusive club. But the Indian Space Research Organization was trying to do things differently. Unlike NASA or the Soviet space program, which aimed to explore space for grand national and scientific ambitions, the ISRO was tasked with creating an indigenous space program solely to allow India to access the practical advantages of space. India has always maintained that India wants space science to be developed for betterment of its people. If you look at it uh, for telecommunications, for electronics, India has used space technology for all of that. I would say the first 20 odd years, the focus was on technology independence. How do you build your own satellites, your own earth stations? How do you launch your own satellites, which means you have to build rockets? By 1994, India had its own liquid stages rocket, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or PSLV. Early 2000s to late 2010s is when PSLV started becoming the workhorse for the world. People could come here to be able to launch their satellites for a much more cost-effective manner and without compromising on quality. That changing of building hardware only for the country to then providing these services globally I think started at the beginning of this century and PSLV was a very critical cog in that. From 1994 to 2017, the rocket launched 48 Indian satellites and 209 satellites from customers abroad. The ISRO had carved out its own place in the space sector. It was the reliable and cost-efficient way to put a satellite into orbit. Launch costs are measured by how much you pay to get one kilogram into orbit. In the mid-90s, India's PSLV rocket was the cheapest way to get hardware into space. It cost around $8,500 per kilogram. That compares to NASA's Atlas II rocket, which cost around $18,700 per kilogram. Fast forward to now, and SpaceX will get you into low orbit for a fraction of that cost. ISRO has already acknowledged that the technologies that are being developed by Elon Musk could be a threat to their business. India's competition is rising, there are billionaires entering into the field. For India to maintain that dominant position, the country needs to step up uh, further. And that step up for India could be its new small satellite launch vehicle. It will have a payload of 500 kilograms and deliver multiple satellites in one mission. But this new rocket may not be enough. 
The ISRO is also developing a reusable rocket like SpaceX's, but the timeline on that is less clear. In the meantime, India's signaled its intent to fundamentally reset its space program. We focused on technology independence, which was essential for the last uh, several decades. Now we need to look outwards and look far. Sushmita Mohanty has over two decades' experience in the space industry and co-founded India's first private space startup, Earth to Orbit, in 2009. She now runs a space think tank. We were sort of at the crossroads and India started thinking, what next? You know, we can build our own stuff, we can launch our own satellites, we use our satellites for a variety of applications. So I think planetary exploration was sort of the natural next step, if you ask me. Sushmita's think tank, Spaceport Sarabhai, aims to help private companies engage with the ISRO, as well as promote India's space technology. We would like to give India an international voice, especially when it comes to space law and policy as it relates to the space environment, space resource mining, in-orbit repair, and, and uh, the kind of lower economy that's starting to emerge. Uh, we would also like to provide guidance to the government on policy matters, using solid research and stakeholder feedback. India's shift from practical space program to exploration hinges on the belief that private companies and private money will take over. India just doesn't have the budget to spend on these things and private in investment can really come in handy. Uh, the current government has always maintained that there's no uh, reason for a government to be in business. And when you look at space as a business, uh, like we have seen in the US or in Europe, uh, the moment you look at space as a business and not just as a strategic asset, that's when you encourage private companies to pump in more money. It's not really new for private companies to invest in Indian space technology. Some of the private suppliers have already supplied to ISRO, but now the government is opening up. We are seeing uh, private uh, satellite players, private launch players, so that's something new and fresh, uh, which is being welcomed by every party. One of those new players is Pixel. Based in Bangalore since 2019, they make satellite hardware and software. We fit in the new mold of companies that are operating independently without having to depend on government support, but work hand in hand to make sure that whatever heritage that the country has had can now be taken to global stages as well. We're building a constellation of the world's first hyperspectral imaging satellites that will provide a much more detailed view of our planet than has been possible. The constellation will be global and it will provide data on a daily basis as well. On the software side of things, we take this data and we build the tools that will enable extraction of insights such as yield prediction, soil health, how's the pollution happening. Pixel is part of a new crop of startups vying for ISRO contracts. Historically, it's been very difficult for smaller companies to win big state deals, but that's changing. ISRO has done all that is needed in terms of indigenous capability. Now it's the responsibility of the private sector to take those up, whether it's communication, earth observation, GPS and whatnot, and build on top of that. That leaves space agencies to do cutting edge work that only governments are willing to spend. A private company can never spend billions of dollars on something that is only for purely research and scientific perspective. This shift in Indian space policy is being driven by Prime Minister Modi himself. He's encouraged India's space ambitions to be a source of national pride. It's necessary because for India, now this linear innovation is not the time. This time is the exponential innovation. He does see space as a strategic sector, both from an economy point of view and a geopolitical uh, tool. He wants to the country to sort of progress towards a $5 trillion economy. So space can play a very big role, both in terms of products and services. As, as a politician, he knows how space can strategically help when it comes to war deterrence. Space can play a role there and also a role in diplomacy. So I think he, he uses both sides of uh, both facets of space. But while the government is drumming up support, critics point out the contradiction that upwards of 360 million Indians live in poverty. 
India is a developing country that runs a fiscal deficit, that runs a budget deficit. So the amount of money you put into the space budget is going to be always under scrutiny. For a country that doesn't have enough toilets for its own people, do you really want to spend money on space technology? The government does have a tough time at times to convince people why space technology is needed, but at the same time, there are some big advocates for it. I don't think it's an either or situation. It's that if we spend on space, doesn't mean we're not spending anything on making other things better. I'll just take a, an example. Schools in India are spread apart. Some of them don't have connectivity to fiber optics. They don't have connectivity to any kind of internet. When India launched its indigenous communication satellite, a lot of these schools were able to come online and be connected with what the other regions of the country were doing just from the fact that there were a few communication satellites that were sent up that enabled that connectivity because getting the other infrastructure from a wire perspective was simply not possible. India's spending needs to be put in perspective. The US remains the undisputed big spender, accounting for 58% of the world space budget, with $47.7 billion spent in 2020. China, which has significantly increased its spending, takes second with $8.9 billion. In 2020, India spent just over $2 billion. What the ISRO and India's space sector is most proud of is what they've achieved with so little. If you look at the budget for India's space missions to the moon uh, and to Mars, you realize that they actually cost a fraction of what it costs to make a Hollywood movie on space. India's first Mars mission cost less than the film The Martian. India got its satellite to the Red Planet for $74 million, $20 million less than the budget for the film. Then when you compare their mission to other nations, the contrast is even starker. NASA's Mars satellite, MAVEN, cost $651 million. That's more than eight times the cost of the Indian mission. But being frugal may not be sustainable or desirable. I think budget constraints can be a good thing, but it can also be a limiting factor. So if you have budget constraints, it invariably um, you know, helps you do things uh, using methods of frugal engineering. But that's not always good when you look at the market and the economy in the sense, if I want to go and compete internationally, I'm a company in Bangalore, I would want the kind of capital that a company in California has to be able to compete internationally. So I think we, we should not stop at frugal engineering. India is looking at space not just as a strategic asset, but also as sort of a source of future profitability. If you look at the likes of what Elon Musk are doing, they're trying to colonize other planets. And any country, any company, any individual that does it first will have a big first mover advantage. I think in order to make space exploration in the coming half century be more humanistic and inclusive, geographically speaking, racially, ethnically, is going to be a huge challenge because a lot of the money rests in a certain part of the world. It would end up being an expedition of sorts where you would only have the wealthy participate, leaving behind a large section of the earth. It's not going to look very pretty. In 1990, Asian nations represented only 9% of global space spending. Now it's 19% and rising. India is determined to be a leader, not a follower, in the new space race.